So, welcome to all of you, stage three. I hope you can all hear me. I only hear myself in one ear and also try to see and understand what's happening here and what you guys can hear and girls. I would like to give you a warm welcome. Um, the Fraunhofer IUK Association is 21 Fraunhofer Institutes who are partners on at Republica 2022. Perhaps you have seen here or heard them. This is organized by the Berlin office of the IUK office. And I wanted to say it because there are so many interested young people. They still need Young student uh, co-workers, if you are interested, after the session, please join in. The colleagues will be happy to see you because they are looking for young guys and students to work with them. The IUK, it's about information and communication. It sounds perhaps a bit wooden, but it's uh, these topics that um, we are dealing with every day in our digital life. The IUK Association, for example, is uh, researching on artificial intelligence, and this is what it's all about. As we've heard, the important question whether we can trust artificial intelligence. We talk about trustful AI, what that is and how we get them and perhaps why we need them. I am Sven Oswald and here in the region of Berlin and Brandenburg. I do a lot of radio and TV and at the RBB. I'm also called the digitalization expert or multimedia expert. So I'm the one who always tries to explain, for example, the things who come in a new to get them close to our listeners and uh, viewers, for example, to make it understand, for example, how important that is for their everyday life. Therefore, um, I'm very interested in that because today we deal with real experts. And before I'm going to present the real experts, I wanted to tell you a bit about regulations. Usually, I say, if you have a question or if you have a comment, usually I say, please raise your hand I'm going to see you and we'll pass around the mic. The problem is I don't see you because um, here we have a lot of light and you are in the dark, so are somewhere lost in a black space or black mass. That's not a problem. If you have a question, please come to this corner to the stage manager. Then I'm going to see you. This is how far I can see. And whenever it's possible, we will be happy to give the floor to you because you don't have so often the possibility to chat with experts directly and to ask your questions directly. But it's about all our lives, of all of us. Therefore, we are also very interested in hearing what you want to say. So here, we normally should be five people here. There was a spoiler alarm. Corona is still there. So one participant, unfortunately, is not here. Therefore, all the best to our State Secretary, Christiana Rohleder. She's positive and unfortunately also ill, so she's not here. Also positively tested and therefore not here, but not sick and therefore somehow participating uh, on our screen is um, Professor Dr. Dr. Frau Rostalski. She's a lawyer um, for legal law, criminal law, for legal um, philosophy and um, a legal arbitration in Cologne, and she's also a member of the German Ethics Council, and she works on digitalization and the challenges on um, the right and morale. Hello, Mrs. Kostowski. Hello, and greetings to you. It's a pity that you can't be here. Well, anyway, it's nice to be with you this way. Hello. Ms. Rostalski, we are going to talk about AI and where we have AI and where the, the journey goes. What is your favorite AI application, for example? Where you, do you deal with these topics or where do you most like to deal with these topics? I like to um, do with AI in a research project um, that I'm um, carrying out together with Fraunhofer Intelligence is AI applications in um, legal aid. I mean, I'm also a criminal aid um, professor, for example, and um, we um, don't know, uh, and it depends on the judge, for example, um, when you do sentencing, and we try to give more transparency into that by sen sentencing databases, because uh, we would need so many people to 
gather all this data and how we can do that with AI. And it's one of my top 10 list of AI applications. It's very much on top. That sounds completely interesting. I'm a bit disappointed. I would have said that you said that my coffee machine needs uh, when um, I need which coffee. And if I smile at my coffee machine, it's going to give you a bit more of this or that. So I'm just an everyday expert who's navigating with AI. And here it stops. This young guy, my dear. This is a colleague of mine. He comes from uh, public broadcasting. He's also a journalist. He is the uh, WDR explaining boy. What uh, I do, he does for the WDR, and he's also a co-founder of the um, uh, WDR, for example. Hub. It's nice to have you here, my dear colleague. I heard that this morning you also had to, to jump in in another panel where someone was ill of corona, so you are a bit um, uh, more relaxed. Uh, we don't know whether he has corona or not, but anyway, I'm relaxed. What's your favorite application of AI, be it in private or professional life? I thought about it. I like uh, music recommendations at Spotify. They really work, but... My favorite, secret favorite is the image correction algorithm, for example. If you have something there and if you say delete, for example, it seems like no one has been in a picture. So you can get rid of people in a, in a picture. This is also something that we have in many apps, for example. So you don't have to have Photoshop for example. And this is Professor Dr. Stefan Hobe, he's Professor of Informatics at the University of Bonn, and he's also the head of the Fraunhofer Institute for Intelligent Analysis and Information Systems, the IAIS, but he's a real digitalization expert. I would uh, call him a dictator pope and an AI pioneer, for example. He has even been rewarded by the uh, Society for Informatics as one of the leading heads of the German AI in intelligence. Hello, Mr. Mobel. It's nice that you are here. Where do you most love to use AI? If I take a picture with the mobile, it's uh, really optimized automatically. I hardly delete uh, my my friends out of them, like this whole set. But um, I like to do that, and I also do music. And there are wonderful things that you can do with music, with AI improving your music and I also love languages and we are researching a lot concerning languages. I like to dictate, I like to talk also in my machines and I'm very happy that I have apps who do that locally where not everything is sent into the cloud for example and my language is not somehow worked on a server and I think this is a very important feature of AI that it works locally. That's great fun so um, I don't like things to be sent somewhere where I don't have a control over it and this brings us to the topic of trusting, but I'm going back to that. Which are the apps? But um, I also send around cool messages, for example, if you read something through. I mean, it's it's great. But let's come back to the current situation, for example. We have seen that each and everyone is using AI somewhere, somehow in a banal navigation or the language recognition software. No props, but where do we stand at the moment? What can AI do at the moment, for example, apart from the fact that it's somewhere in all the parts of our life, technically, for example. Where are we at the moment and where do we go in the future? We believe that we all know AI. We have been discussing about it for many years, for five years at least, and many know AI, like deep neural networks, for example. It's, it seems uh, like an everyday word, but we are still at um, ground zero of the new AI which is going to come. And this is important to know for all of us. It's the big models, the transformer models, the GPT models who can do extremely great things. Perhaps you know one or the other example, and you might know it. That if you have trained a big model, for example, and uh, you have taken until 2019, for, for example, what 2019 we did not have was Corona, for example. If you tell such an AI model in 2020 there was a big new pandemic, um, that led to contract contact restrictions, for example. Dear AI, can you tell
tell me which um, areas will be affected, then the AI will tell you it's probably those who have a lot to do with personal contacts. That's um, a quote. Like gastronomy, for example, hotel catering and events, they will be mainly affected. Production and other areas will not be so much affected. This means what we know now as an AI, for example, the simple recommendation algorithms, etc., also image. Um, um, you ain't seen nothing yet. So if we discuss about what AI, we don't discuss about the past or the things that we already know. We have to talk about what's going to come in the year, next years. This means that we already can do a lot, but the real revolution is going to come in the next five years. Do we have to be afraid of AI or can we look forward to it? I mean, today we wanted to talk about trustworthy AI. What's your feeling about that? I'm completely relaxed because I trust in our society. Society. If I didn't do that, I would not be relaxed at all. I mean, the technical AI is neutral, but it can be used for things that no one of us wants to have, but that would be possibly be able to use or abuse by one of the other stakeholders. So I think here we are at the right place to talk about that, whether we shall be afraid of it or not. The, the technology of AI, it's a great thing um, also to show our ideas in society, as um, Professor Kostalski said, for example, with AI, we can make sure, for example, that the criminal law becomes more just and more fair, but we also can make it more unfair and unjust. It depends on how it's going to be implemented, and that's also our objective in research, that we provide the right tools to use AI correctly so that it helps. We all have to discuss about it, how it shall look like in the future. And there is a third case. So there are the good ones, and there are the bad ones who use it, and there are the lay people who use it, and and then something happens. Uh, we had uh, Microsoft uh, AI or Amazon AI where things have happened that no one had thought up front or no one knew enough about it. So um, the current state of the art, for example, AI as it is today and what we use, can we trust it or shall we not trust it at all in God's sake? Well, first of all, um, as a legal expert and as a lawyer, for example, from the ethical perspectives, for example, I think we definitely have to see that concerning regulation, we are not as far as we wished to be or where we should be. But the good thing about it and the positive aspect, for example, is that everything is on a good way. From the EU Commission, we have an AI Act, which is much more concrete than anything we had before. It's going to take some place until we implement all these regulations. And then I also assume that in Germany, we will get uh, right legislation that will make it possible for us to trust AI more than we can do it today. Which is the situation today? Today, for example, we have to trust those who provide technologies and the producers. And this, of course, uh, has some imminent risks that this person does not have the same values that we have in Europe. This means, um, to, to cut it short, that technology, for example, might contain values that we do not want to have. And, uh, well, this is a challenge for our society, I think, and this is something we have to face by regulating as quickly as possible by creating standards and law and also revision procedures for certification of applications, for example, but um, without sounding um, too bad, for example, to make sure that it's not a threat. Most AI applications that we have, they are not so intensive, for example. They don't touch upon so much into the freedoms and the rights of individuals. Like you mentioned the coffee machine, for example. I don't drink coffee, so I had to disappoint you. But for for example, if you take something like that, I mean, there the danger is not so big that your fundamental rights are cut. I think in many of the applications, we can trust a lot and we can use them with a lot of trust without being afraid of this new technology. But at the end of the day, the question is not that we can trust it because it's trustworthy because it's not really relevant for the important questions. Well, okay. Now we have a great example. My colleague Horn has a double role today or even triple role with the presentation of this morning. Okay, but today he's representing public broadcasting, but also representing the uh, 
WDR Innovation Hub, and you have an application that you are testing at the moment, which um, AI makes AI-generated news without people coming in. It's, it's, it's from sports, it's a prototype, for example, but what exactly do you do there? I think it's a discipline that, from a journalistic point of view, has been existing for some years, and very often it was called robot journalism before, and it was rules-based, and it works everywhere where you have reporting areas, for example, where you have a great uh, database like uh, stock market and weather or sports. And with the Sportschau, for example, and um, with broadcasting, we also have access to a lot of data on soccer games, for example. And uh, our idea was whether this in a newer form, for example, could be made uh, AI-based. And we have built a prototype in the past months that um, instantly shows the reporting um, for the Bundesliga soccer games. And at the moment, and I think that is also an, an important topic, we have come to certain borders and limits, like uh, the limits of the big language models, for example, that write, write text, but they can also... Uh, you know, make a fabulation, for example, and the more facts you have, the more difficult it becomes to combine it with a database, uh, with all the, the game data, for example, and um, that's problematic, and we've come to that limit. Then also, we went down to the level of individual sentences, and also we let uh, people write sentences that are usually in such a report on a soccer match by our colleagues, and then together with AI, we tried to paraphrase phrase sentences, so to, to show a variance, for example, and we had much more variance, for example, we have a virtual editor that we have created, um, that's our own development for this prototype, for example, and it shows that the sentences step by step are shown, and um, then you have to log in once again, that um, is uh, hopefully um, the most difficult to the last sentence, so that the sentences don't come across as staccato. Uh, and we have seen, for example, we have worked on the, the ability and the variance of these texts to make sure that you don't even fail that it comes from a machine. I don't know whether it's going to be a product for the public. There, Once again, we have to talk about trust in journalism. We have the four-eye principle, so someone else has to check what is being published, whether everything is fine or not. But what if you made the production process easier? The colleagues, for example, who look at uh, the soccer games and said it's um, 0-2, for example, and then the other team is winning 3-2. Two, for example, and then you have to change everything, for example, because the moment the match is over, you have one to put in the article online, and if in minute 85, for example, you might be able to generate, and you have your raw material, for example, that you can still work on, for example, but they have also more time to look at analyst analytics. So, in a minute 89, for example, before the final whistle, for example, you want to do broadcasting with the article being produced in the background already. Now, we don't want to have it as a catalyst, for example, for warm work density, but we would like to use it as a means, for example, to improve our texts. Of course, you could also say that we can uh, image a bit more. If the whole content is generated automatically, then as a recipient, for example, um, as a soccer fan, for example, could I regenerate the article? I mean, if you're a fan of one team, the article would be different than if you're a fan of the other team or if you are a neutral um, sports um, journalist from the WDR. Yes, as if you had known it. <laughs> so, um, we had try to build in a perspective. Personalization, for example, that we talk about a lot in media companies, for example, and also the question of recommendations. Then beyond that, personalization means that I get a recommendation for further content, so I have a landing page, for example, where I can um, show something else, for example, which is up to my interest, for example. And how much personalization um, do I, or can I get in the content? So in these prototypes, for example, you can look at the same match or you can get a text whether it's Borussia Dortmund or Bayern München or from whatever perspective. 
And um, also in a user survey, for example, we try to solve the questions, which role does it play for the people? For example, can we learn something from, from these filter discussion? For example, if I know that I'm in this perspective, can I change my perspectives? Questions like that, for example, we are dealing with and um, in also in a neutral area. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to test it in politics, for example. I mean, theoretically, if it works in soccer, then it would be easy to use it in all the other areas, research, education, or politics. I'm not sure whether it shall be transferred per se, but I think you can learn things from that. And um, that would be, yeah, it's a great uh, cliffhanger, for example. And Ms. Wasalski, for example, is that the moment where you have to do regulation? I mean, if that works in, in soccer, for example, that it is not made the same way in politics? Well, yes, I think it's a great example where you could also show what I mean with the intensity of interfering, for example. It is not so relevant in uh, soccer intensity without wanting to um, step on the toes of soccer games. It's not as uh, perhaps uh, tricky as a political conference who has said what, for example, and with the representation, for example, of focal points or taking out certain statements, for example, you can do a completely different reporting, for example, and this uh, reporting is not objective. I mean, not even in soccer games. You always see it through the glasses of the ones who who are reporting. And of course, you also also can convey a message and there would also warn against it to say that something is especially objective if it's done by uh, an AI machine. This is where we really have to watch out as a society, whether we want to pass that away or to transfer it to machines. If you look at the war in Ukraine, for example, if I imagine that the main reporting is done by AI, um, I think it would be highly problematic. Well, the different opinions also are formed by people at the moment, but you also see what it makes with people and what it does to people who read them. And if the journalists don't know where the AI is acting or in which direction into it's going, then we have to really watch out. And we talked a lot about it, that we need more regulations. But do we regulate AI at the moment, Ms. Ostalski? And do we regulate it? How can you do that technically? Okay, that's exactly the point that we are researching on and that we are implementing with certain companies, how you can practically implement a regulation. Ms. Korostalski said we have the AI Act, we have some preparatory work on high-level commissions at the European Union, for example, and there we have the right ideas and um, we have included what we want to have in society. The question is whether it can be reviewed and verified. Now, at the moment, we have mathematic measures, for example, like fairness and that we, some, some things that we have to find out. And you can also download uh, the definitions for those who are interested in that. You can download of how to try to be fair. And on this basis, we make up a revision catalog. And in this revision catalog, um, there are people who have certain demands to systems and certain requirements or who want to tell the public, for example, that certain requirements are met. They they have to prove them and um, they have to be able to be reviewed and verified. A uh, very important um, difference between AI and other products, for example, um, like that AI, for example, creates evolving problems products, for example, that have to be monitored and uh, reviewed regularly. If you check AI, you not only check the product, for example, but you also review the processes around this product and um, that have been established by the ones who use them, like ML operations or AI operations, for example. And that's very important in the whole field of AI, because many of you might know these examples of systems of artificial intelligence that have been broadcasted publicly and then they continue learning and evolving and they produce things that no one wants to have. Therefore, we need these processes and we are doing the first checks and revisions and interesting, interestingly, quite in, in Germany, many companies are interested to do these checks by AI systems because that also um, underlines my optimism because they think that it's good to their products for making money for the company, for being reliable 
reliable, but also being reliable concerning public opinion. That's also interesting to see that reliability on concerning social values, it's not a contradiction to the objectives of a company. I mean, a company, of course, they want to create sustainable values with artificial intelligence, and only if a system has been correctly reviewed um, concerning standards, fairness, etc., this can happen. So this is how, how you check and review artificial intelligence, and on this basis you can regulate, for example, and you can make sure that they come up to new standards and artificial intelligence, hopefully, with um, these jobs, will become like other complex things that we're using. I mean, if you take the car or a train or an airplane or even a bicycle, for example, we expe expect these things to be reviewed and checked, that they meet the requirements, that they are not going to stumble down. If uh, with my 80 kilograms, for example, I go on my, my bike, that it's going to hold up to my weight. And um, these checks and revisions in the next years, I think, will also be happening with artificial intelligence in the years to come. Yes. I mean, I see this debate not only with companies, but also in politics. And we will talk about the question, for example, how much regulation we already have in politics. Well, in the future, I would wish that politics also um, adhere to these um, measures for themselves. I've seen in the past years, for example, that in the frame of this hype that had been created around AI, for example, that we also saw something that people try to believe blindly in technology. We also have to talk about limits here, for example, to see until where do we want to go and where do we have a great insecurity which is created. And together with this perhaps a bit uh, dark uh, side or, or myths of technology, this then can be transferred to politics, for example, and their proposals for solutions for certain problems that we have. When we talk about, for example, hate comments and how do we deal with them, or the discussion about upload filters on YouTube, for example, how reliable is all that? Because I think the answer to this question is not as positive as politics wish it to be. And therefore, I think also here from the political side, I think we also need uh, further laws, for example. is um, That's a basic problem, and uh, I would like to open this question to our audience, for example. It's not only a question of understanding. If, when, if we talk about AI, I mean, each and everyone has another idea about how AI looks like today or shall look like in the future. Also, with cloud computing and, and industry 4.0, for example, it's a great buzzword, and everyone um, has an idea about that, so we have to define What's a trustworthy AI for the future? What's your idea about that? But the problem is also, for example, uh, as you said, Mr. Gobel, that the companies want to get it checked. But the problem is that they don't even understand what they know and what the risk and the opportunities are, that many people don't even know what their own AI is doing at the moment. I mean, AI very often and the algorithms are a black box for many companies and they don't know why they get the result they get. And um, they don't know where to interfere. To give you an example, for example, I looked at your institutes, for example, for broadcasting about an image recognition software. You could ask AI questions, for example, that where is the ball, for example. So you saw uh, in a baseball picture, for example, and you saw then the catcher. And um, I, I don't know how, how those rules are called, for example. And then um, the AI said, um, well, the ball um, is in the air. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. But why does AI deduct that the ball is in the air? And it was uh, highlighted like a little cloud. And it was not the little red ball that they saw, but they saw the blue helmet, for example, of um, uh, the catcher, for example, and the ball was somewhere there, and then they deducted the ball is in the air. So there, as a, as a person, you could see why the AI deducted what they did, but in many more complex things, we should be able to always deduct and see. Well, the, the challenge that we have in AI models is that complexity is too big to explain everything in detail. The model that I have just said, for example, um, like for example, the question about Corona, for example, 450 billion parameters we have about them, for example. And if you say that you have 48 digits after the comma, no one can understand it. Not
not even the researchers. So artificial intelligence definitely is not going to become more trustworthy by explaining the models. This only works for the easiest models that you can write manually. They are explanatory models, and if you can explain them, they are no AI anymore. There are many researchers who try to simplify models, of course, to do approximating models, we call them, um, that come close to reality, but that, that there is an inherent false calculations, because if we simplify models in a way that we can, can explain them in one minute, then the reality is far away from them. I mean, the best explanation is an easy one and a simple one, and you have to simplify it as long as things are get wrong. And we have to do differently with AI. We will be able to make statements. We do this for autonomous driving, for example, person and, and um, object recognition, for example. We have to estimate insecurities. So we are going to talk about probabilities, for example, to also deduct certain mistakes. And there you have to experiment a lot. And you always have to know that the probability of errors happening is not going to be zero. That's why processes are important. And as uh, Dr. Rostalski also mentioned, the criticality also of processes is very important. I mean, if I have a nuclear power plant, uh, I mean, then some, some mistakes in controlling are much worse than in wrong music recommendation. And that also AI um, has also done um, a ranking to risks and uh, criticality, for example, and they have to be assessed concerning their criticality. But if we look at the fact, I think um, with all the other technical artifacts, for example, I mean, the probability of mistakes is never going to be zero. I mean, if I take a plane or if I, if I go by car, for example, there is always this margin of error, and this is going to be, say, in AI. I mean, if I grab a car or my plane, I mean, unfortunately, I'm going to see the mistakes and the consequences of these mistakes. And in AI, I don't see them immediately. So I think we need another indicator, for example, that tells me, okay, watch out, something's going wrong. When we talk about billions of parameters and no one can understand them, and um, it would be nonsense uh, to manually check them, then AI would not be helpful. So there, I think we need to do a lot more research. And also here, I would also like to, to do a bit of definitions. Ms. Rostalski, would you um, like to comment on that before I ask the people around me for that definition? Just a short comment. I mean, it's all right what the, the colleague said. Just one point I would like to add concerning standards and standard science, for example. I think it's important if we as a society come to a point to say here, it is really so important for us to know what's in the box that we can exclude errors. This means that our values come first in case of doubt. This does not mean that our technology um, is something that we have to use only because it's technically possible, but we have to define what we want to use and what makes sense for us and what's important and valuable for us. So the decision about which technology we want to use and how we want to use the technology, this has to be normative. So we as a society have to discuss that. Is that something where we want to bear the risk or is that something where we do not want to bear the risk? To give you one example, which I think is quite um, practical. For example, in X-ray analysis, for example, everyone now is in, in, in cancer research, for example, this technology um, works great to see whether there is a higher risk, for example, if, um, if something in the picture calls for cancer or not. So there I think the most relevant thing is not that the user or someone else is able to understand each and every parameter. But it's different, I think, if it's a technology, which is AI-based, for example, that, um, for example, is used for youth offices making decisions, for example, shall I take a child out of a family to put them into the system or not? There, I think, it's essential that we as a society, that we know how this technology works or not. Just to give you one example, and if that does not work, and if we can't do that well enough, then in case of doubt, we have to say this technology is not going to be an improvement of the status quo, and then we have to let go. Yeah, I think beyond any doubt, yes. Ms. Rostalski, I don't know whether you hear it, but um, you are getting applause from our audience. This is why we need this discourse to, to make these decisions together. I think the difficulty that we have that the non-use of AI 
also possibly might create a damage. One of my favorite damage uh, examples is autonomous driving. Um, if I have an autonomous driving, for example, can we accept mistakes and people are hurt? No, it's not acceptable, of course. And then there are forecasts who say that most fatalities um, in road traffic are caused by people and not by machines. And if all the cars were controlled automatically, then the number of fatalities in road traffic would drop by 50%. And this makes this whole discussion so complex. I mean, AI makes mistakes and will make mistakes. But on the other hand, the non-use of AI perhaps is another challenge and another big challenge. So I think we are on the right event. This is a discussion we have to keep on leading as Ms. Rostalski is doing it. I think it makes a lot of sense to talk about these examples. And I think it's really great that those come up who are mentioned. We have these um, famous examples, for example, of application processes, for example, where applicants are sorted out by an AI, for example, and they look at the original data, for example, where we have discrimination of women. And these are the real problems that we are talking about. You ask, for example, where, uh, whether our image of AI, for example, is not a problem and uh, the image we have, yes, I think it was not so good that people like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, for example, that they warned against the box of the Pandora, for example, and the super AI that might take over um, the global leadership because um, this plays into this science fiction image that we have of AI and it uh, deviates us from the problems that we have in fact today and that we should be discussing today. And there is another big problem I think we have because we are sitting here, all of us here together, and we are thinking about which AI we want to create, how and how to use it. But the we, who is we? We said we as a society, but there is not only one society. I mean, we have our society, there are other societies and there are other states and there are other people who are not so well-meaning, for example, or people who simply just stupidly think about profit. So if we don't build an AI in a way which is technically possibly possible because we have a moral filter, for example, it does not mean that it's not going to come or it does not mean that someone else is not going to have this moral filter, for example. So AI have to be certified, and that's also difficult, if they physically are used at one place or in one country. That's many questions. Concerning the first question, I think, which is very important, who is we? Well, we. First is our society. And such a societal definition processes in our democracy are regulated by formal procedures, uh, mainly by parliament. And I think here it is also very important aspects to really see that it is really the task of the legislator. And this is what's also happening at the moment. Their civic society has to be included. And we do that with events like the event of today. There are representations of interests, for example. And this is what's happening normally when you make laws, hoping that we will find a broad social context. And for us, in our society, in a democracy, in a lived democracy, it's very typical that not each and every opinion will be reflected in the final result. But therefore, we also have the, the mechanism of the protection of minorities. So these, um, this is the process for me when I talk about we. And second point. I think we can talk about uh, uh, demands and requirements and establish very high moral standards, but we nevertheless run the risk that others don't have the same standards. As you said, we need uh, the instrument of a certification, for example. That's one tool. Or checking or test stands and application procedures, for example. Also there, we have um, various possibilities um, to interfere with the rights of those who are going to market it, measured against criticality, for example. Um, what's the sharp knife that we want that you want to use to get to a final result? So I don't see such a big danger because we know this approach from other example and um, the GDPR for example everyone had said that this was devilish and now it's called one of the safest standards for example and at the beginning everyone thought we are never going to make it well we are going to make it and if we make it when we have to make it if you say if you want to sell your products here or there you have to go through these tests 
and reviews, and then one day it will work. So whenever you start regulating, there is also the danger of over-regulating, and there are also economists who say you are binding our hands, and uh, you look at the Americans or in the Asian room for example, how can we keep up if they don't have such a regulation and try out everything? On the other hand, there is the tendency that people say, no, it's well thought. Could that not be even a purchase argument, for example? I mean, Mr. Borden, for example, you are doing spin-offs and researching of things that happen very quickly in, in economy. This the, would, Wouldn't that be such a made-in-Germany tack, for example, that has a good reputation globally? Yes, when you talked about um, the language processing, for example, if you use it as a standard on a mobile phone, what you say is sent to a server, then it's analyzed, and then you get the result back. And we have this discussion whether that's okay, that support members, for example, that they can rate private conversations from private households to improve their systems, whether that's okay or not. I think in Germany, everyone would say it's not okay. So therefore, we have developed systems who run locally on a mobile phone, a small processor, for example, or in a car. And there are big automotive um, producers, for example, and who are testing it, and hopefully we will get a series production there. And this will be a clear competitive edge because it means a function safety. We don't need internet. We don't need connections. The systems all also works locally. And second, there is no discussion about the fact where do my data go because everything runs locally. So yes, it is a competitive edge, but it also reminds all of us that we also have to work on it on the one hand to voice our opinion in political debate, but also in what we use ourselves, because there we can also observe that um, this, this quite discussed language recognition, for example, is being used, for example, by people in this collective we without any concerns. So we need this debate. I don't think that this we, that we said, is homogeneous. We need much more debates and discussions as we're having it today here to see what we are talking about. And I think it has to go beyond Germany. We as an economic area, the, we need the 450 million people who live in Europe to have the right weight, for example. And the GDPR that we have, for example, also is an export hit worldwide because uh, the standard was set in Europe. And this is why we have a weight globally and only this way can our voice be heard. So I'm absolutely clear in favor of the fact that the uh, European Parliament, for example, gets more rights to to push forward this parliamentarian process, as Wasalski has mentioned, and also to to have this process at a European level, and we want to have it for all democratic societies. Are we fast enough? I mean, democracy needs time because many people can say their opinion and it has to go through many instances to make sure that um, um, we don't abuse our freedom and all the rights. So technological developments are often very fast. So is it possible that with all our new ideas that we come too late? And it's not going to be one bad AI. I mean, that's clear. But um, have we um, put uh, the child out with a bath, for example? What do you think? No, I don't think so. I think uh, through legal and ethics, um, we can also shape our economy. We have to react and also we can change back a certain development. Uh, the GDPR, for example, um, it does not only exist um, before data are used. Um, I mean, the data have been used before. So improved standards standards and uh, improved legal spaces can be made um, reality by the improvement of legislation. I think we are not doing so bad concerning our timeline. We have heard um, that we have um, ground zero or hour zero, so to say, and it's not bad to write laws um, in hour zero. If I think about biotechnology, for example, the prohibition of cloning, for example, others are lagging much more behind than we are concerning AI technology. And perhaps one point um, of what has been said before, if we ask ourselves, for example, um, are we doing bad, are we overtaken by markets and products of other markets, at the end of the day, it's the people who are going to decide what they want to use. And 
if we lived in utopia where everyone wants to say, do I want to live in uh, Europe of the 21st century or in Northern Korea, uh, most of them would go for the first. And I think this um, can also be applied to values in certain products. If I don't know whether my vacuum cleaner, for example, um, whether he's going to listen in and tap um, into my um, home apartment, I'm not going to buy it. Well, for normal users, for example, I would like to share this optimism, but in reality, I see that things are different. I mean, we all know, for example, that the cheapest and smartest uh, um, lights, for example, they attack service, but uh, but the, the normal users are not interested in that or not enough interested. So, yeah, many people say, yeah, my data is very important. And then someone does a wonderful chat app or a great smartphone and everything just forgets about data safety because they want to use this app. So society has to do more. Mr. Starsky and Dennis, I think you have a similar problem. Yes, um, I have to defend uh, the ideal person that I've just described. I mean, there are things that are, go beyond uh, the personal responsibility. There are uses that are not possible in a different way because otherwise you don't have the technology and the capabilities or perhaps not the means. And there we are as a society. There we have to show what's going wrong and we have to offer solutions for that. And there as a society, and also in politics, we are requested to do something. Yes, you ask for speed. Yes, I mean, um, things are happening quicker and quicker. If we talk about the AI Act, I think um, it's a much quicker reaction than usual, usual um, legislative procedures like copyright, for example, or the debate space in digital room, for example, or what we have seen in the past. Angela Merkel said, the internet is all new for us and everyone laughed. But that's true, she was right. So also we have to really deal in depth with it, what that means to find answers to all the these questions, for example, and I would even say that we have become quicker and um, I am also full of hope because um, if we look at our economic area, how it's made up, if regulations are made in our economic area, I mean, the companies are trembling. Yes, and um, also here in, in journalism, for example, they are quite tight-lipped when um, uh, we talk about uh, regulations to come because they are not always happy about them but for many years we were not fast enough and this is um, dropping on our feet we live in a country where the whole generation of decision makers and um, i talk about the males mainly also they were coquette about that that um, they did not use the these smartphones and that is a problem that we are suffering today the internet trend change for example i understand all that but you also mentioned something you said that you believe that we have become quicker and faster well yes we are discussing all these developments under the aspect of the whole jump innovation as we have seen it as of 25 2005 with the iphone and all the things and then platforms and platform economy etc and all the things and i think we are overseeing that these developments for some years they are not continuing as before. We are, um, I think, um, if we say that we are too slow, we are parting from wrong assumptions. I mean, we don't have the same speed everywhere. This is why I do not want to say that we, oh, we are always too slow. We have roughly 10 minutes left concerning all of us. Um, we are too slow. I would like to talk about um, how to make AI more trustworthy, for example. What are the next steps that we have to take? And how can we um, bring it to the conscience of those who really use AI already today from a legal point of view? What do you think? I mean, it's also a question of warranty. I mean, you can tell companies, for example, if you do something wrong, you will have to pay for the damages and uh, to come up with damage claims. As I said in the beginning, I think concerning regulations, not everything has been solved perfectly. Data protection is uh, well worked on 
but I think anti-discrimination protection, there is still a lot of open space, also how to protect autonomy of users. Warranty is a different topic that has to be addressed, be it with collective responsibility, also um, whether there might be an e-person, for example, or um, artificial intelligence application, will also get an all warranty volume in autonomous driving cars, for example. This is mildly discussed. I come from criminal law, um, also with the principle of guilt, for example. We can't go that far. Um, as long as we don't have a very strong AI that is legally equal to people. And we have another problem. If we look at this black box topic that we heard about, what do you do if you have a person who uses an AI application that leads to a mistake, but the mistakes had not been foreseeable for this person. So you do a damage for someone else, but you could not foresee this damage. What's the basic criterion for that? Who is going to be responsible? And this is something we have to think about. Um, can we then um, talk about previous behavior, for example, if it's an admissible technology or not? So these are questions that we are hotly debating amongst the legal experts. Okay, how can we create a trustworthy AI? So what are the next points, for example? What do you need to say? This is how we can develop and certify trustworthy AI. I think it's very important here that uh, responsibility for the use of AI cannot be left to individuals. We tend to say, well, use this offer or end-to-end -end, um, classified messages etc for example and end-to-end uh, -end encrypted messages for example this is very important for data protection but if we look around i think that's not the right way forward so we have to create trust we have to make sure that society deals with it that politicians deal with it that we create the the legal framework so as a standard i can rely on that that for example um, the socket um, that's here or some electric products i i don't i don't have to look at it and the thickness of the cable, I can rely on the fact that it's going to work well, mostly, that this is a socket, for example, that meets the uh, usual standards of the industry. And this is what we have to create for artificial intelligence. In Germany, we have this rather complex uh, national coordination um, circle of um, AI norms and norms and standardization. There we have representatives from the economy, <laughs> consumer protections, <laughs> legal experts, trade union scientists, everyone is included. We have seen that it's a process where different sectors are developing their own standards. We heard about recruiting, for example, HR. Autonomous procedures, for example, there we will have to work out standards for certain industries so that you can rely on that if you use certain products that they meet the standards of the sector. And this is what we are trying to do at the moment in research. And we, I think the sectors will implement them. They have to, and I think they will. If you say autonomous procedures, but um, I mean, I mean, I mean, um, that's that's process. That's not really autonomous driving. Where I can also go wrong. No, no, it's not autonomous driving. No, I recall we talked about autonomous processing. It's what you think? What do you think? How to make AI more trustworthy? For example, to, to if you look at your listeners and, and and your viewers, for example, well, an AI. I went to Paris and the AI Development Center of Facebook. And they call it explainable AI. And I think that plays a very important role. Um, it makes it more transparent and understandable concerning AI systems. From the journalistic point of view, I think there... Uh, we have to know more about basic knowledge of editors, for example. So the the estimation, where do we have the real problems? And journalists love images. Um, very often with my editors, um, they, they, they rather want to talk about this future scenario of Elon Musk's instead of dealing with explanatory graphs of machine learning. So that is a challenge. How many abstract topics from pandemic to climate change 
um, and how, how can we convey them and can, how can we find the right forms of conveying information. That's an important task for journalism. So uh, there's a lot to do. But before we open up another topic, I would like to thank all of you and give you the possibility here to perhaps ask one question or two from the audience. We have our stage managers here. We have a microphone here. If someone wants to raise a question, it's now or never. Okay. It doesn't seem so. Oh, there's one question. Yes. Young gentleman, please tell us your name. I'm Thomas. Well, for me, trust has a lot to do with um, the fact of knowing what really happens where. To be honest, if I'm only marginally dealing with this topic, I have no idea where I meet AI or where I have to deal with it. I assume that um, many people are using um, AI and it's never going to be certified, for example. I mean, is there planned to send out information, for example, where people really are in touch with AI? I mean, where are we influenced by AI? I mean, w w w like a seal, this contains AI. For example, automatically generated texts of journalists, for example, in the internet, even today, you sometimes find texts, whether you ask yourself whether they have been written by people or not. Or Google Duplex, for example, they called a hairdresser and um, they wanted to make an appointment. And I think it's uh, really important to know, is it something I use that other people have made or has it automatically been created? That would be one proposal. I think this, this has to be implemented, definitely. I think one more question. Otherwise, um, I'm going to be blended out. My name is Christoph. I have one question. We discussed a lot about responsibility of AIs, whether it's ethically correct or not, uh, whether it's right or not. Sometimes I have the feeling the big problem of AI is that um, they create an economic imbalance because very often they are used by big companies against individuals, like insurances, for example. They use them to make sure that they don't have to pay a service anymore. And that's a problem, for example, if with a chatbot you, you try to solve a problem that you have with a product. I mean, you, you feel like being in dystopia. So this is a topic, I think, that is not discussed enough, irrespective of the fact whether the car hits uh, uh, the, the grandmother or a pupil, hopefully no one, but AI, uh, in my opinion, as a citizen, um, it does not work for me as an individual, but only for big capital. Okay, someone from, I mean, unfortunately, we are really running out of time. I would compare it to the mechanism that Facebook is creating and Twitter, for example, to make decisions contestable. Nicole Dickmann, for example, um, she um, um, had posted this, this Napalm war image um, from the Vietnam War. So I think in regulation we um, have need to find mechanisms for contestability. Well, unfortunately, we have to stop. You would have had to use these times that are one question or two, but perhaps we can stay on stage and perhaps bilaterally we will be able to sort out your questions. So I would like to thank you, all of you, also, that despite your positive test, but unfortunately you are not really ill, hopefully it's going to stay like that, that you joined us digitally. I'm sorry that you can join in to have a drink and all the other festivities and parties um, that are slowly starting in this arena. Mr. Wobe, thank you so much for your information, Dennis, also. Thank you so much that you have participated, although this morning you already had to jump in. Thank you so much for being interested. And if there is one question or the other, we are slowly but surely are going to leave the room. So you will also also be able to ask us questions directly and, and have fun at Republica. Thank you.